world-class lessons from the real estate industry's top 1%, empowering agents to think bigger and do more to create life by design. Get access to exclusive interviews with top producing real estate professionals. Listen in as we talk about their journey in the business, best practices, and lessons learned. Hosted by Kiro Nasrallah and John Scipioni. I mean, one thing that we always say in our office is just action is better than perfection, right? This is Light It Up with Lighthouse Residential. All right, you guys, welcome back to another episode of Light It Up Podcast. I am thrilled to have with us today Mr. Angel Garcia, based in Los Angeles, California. Angel, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thanks for having me on, man. I'm excited to be here. I like how I always say Mr. Angel Garcia. Like uh, It's a real <laughs> prominent thing. It's a, I, I haven't ever really been called Mr. All my life, it's been Junior. Mr. <laughs> so, Mr. Hey, kid. <laughs> <laughs> So Angel, we're always looking to bring people to the platform that we think can bring tremendous value. And uh, obviously it was a, a very quick uh, uh, idea to have you on the show. So thank you so much for spending some time with us today and, and uh, we really appreciate it. Man, I'm, I'm excited to be here. So let's, uh, let's answer some questions and hopefully bring some value to the audience. Awesome, man, we'll dig deep. So we always thought that Angel would be a, uh, a really great person to have on the show because a lot of times we're sitting down with team leaders, people who are, you know, currently real estate agents and, you know, trying to build a team and, and you know, really a lot of people who are focused on residential resale. But Angel's completely different. He's sort of, uh, when we first met him years ago, he was leading a residential real estate team in Los Angeles. He's now sort of shifted into more of the uh, flipping wholesaling business. And uh, we thought that would be a really, really exciting, yeah. you know, story to share with you guys. So, um, you know what we'll I'm going to say there? in preparation to this uh, uh, podcast, I did want to say one of the most innovative people uh, in the real estate space today. So, um, you know, if you could walk us through your journey in terms of what you've done till being able to build the system that you have for the wholesaling and flipping business, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess uh, I'll start off with where I started with uh, being a realtor, right? So as a realtor, I was doing well and, uh, you know, I was doing over 100 deals a year for a couple of years, few years, right? And it, what I found was just that the same strategies that I was using to do business as a realtor was the same strategy I was using to do flips or to find flip opportunities and to also start, uh, you know, actually going through the process and flipping a property and buying something for a good price and then reselling it for a profit. Um, what I quickly realized is that I was making large profits, uh, obviously in the market that we've been in, uh, it also been able to help a lot, right? Where you think you're making, you're going to make 50,000, you end up making a hundred thousand and in COVID maybe sometimes even a little bit more, right? But, uh, it was, it was really a, a decision based off of return on time. Um, I noticed that my return on time was just so much higher with uh, flips, which I was always told that it was actually the opposite. I was told that, you know, if you get into flipping, um, it's so time consuming and, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of things behind it. Well, and the way that I had it set up, it was not more time consuming at all. It was the exact opposite. Um, I didn't really have too many people reaching out to me to get certain things done. Um, like I would in my regular, re regular residential uh, transaction business, right? My uh, brokerage business, right? So it just quickly became a, a, a better alternative for me. And gotcha. I started pulling on that thread. I started learning a little bit more, learning a little bit more. And then at some point I said, you know what, what does it look like to actually scale this out? Um, and then I started experimenting a little bit. I started hiring uh, different mentors and then uh, learning a little bit more about the investment space. And then I started realizing that I had a better opportunity as well when I can cover a larger area uh, geographically. So I'm in Los Angeles, you know, very dense market, right? There's a lot of uh, there's, there's a lot of people in Los Angeles, um, large market. But the problem was is that it's a very like part compartmentalized type of market, right? Like you're one side of the LA is one side of LA, the other side of LA is completely different, right? Like let's say for example, everybody knows famous areas like Beverly Hills versus South Central. Well, they're not very far apart, right? Um, but you're, you're just not gonna really be working with both clientele in most cases, right? Um, at least in a regular scalable fashion from what I've seen. Um, you know, you, you're, 
your marketing and what your efforts and that kind of cater to either or. So right. with the investment side, um, it allowed me to go much further geographically than I was able to hit uh, as a realtor. Um, and the reason is, is because people don't really care about how many properties you've sold in a neighborhood when you're buying the property. If you're making them an offer to purchase a property and it's an offer that they like, they'll take it. They don't care if you're buying it and you know, you're buying a property in Kansas and you're in California. Um, yeah. but if you're in one part of LA being, you know, 45 minutes uh, from one side to the other side or 45 miles for that matter, right? It's like, it, it's much harder to earn that business. So yeah. that was originally what led me on. And then once I realized that I can scale it out actually easier than I was scaling out my residential brokerage business because of the geographical limitations, I made a decision that I was going to go full throttle into my investment business. Wow. Wow. You said a lot there. <laughs> One of the I, biggest I, things that I don't know if you realize is when in the real estate business, when you learn to detach yourself from the emotions, that's when you actually grow even more. So in flipping, everybody here has flipped not at your scale, but the, the emotional strain, it's not really a time consuming thing. It's more of an emotional draining thing where you're constantly worried about what's going on, the cost of the construction, where is the contractor, and you're freaking out emotionally. And that's what's causing you to spend more time thinking about yeah. it. But when you're able to detach yourself from that too, emotions get in the way of everything. That's a good, yeah. that's a good takeaway for me. <laughs> I, I had two takeaways. I mean, first and foremost, I think you said, um, as a listing agent, you know, we're always constantly hunting for our next deal, right? Right. You know, as you try to do, you know, constantly doing X number of flips each and every month, you're constantly hunting for your next deal, right? So the listing agent's hunting for sellers, you're hunting for just opportunities. Is that fair to say? Yeah. The, the second big takeaway for me was that you wanted to sped, spread geographically. And in order to do so, you sort of really need to have a more geographic track record as an agent. Whereas, you know, a flipper, it's like no one really cares how many homes you bought or sold. Yeah. It's just can you close on my property or not? Right. Yeah. Can you get me to the closing table? So that's that's wildly important. Yeah. It, it's it's opportunities of scale. Right. So. You know, just for the record, by the way, because I said 45 miles. Well, 45 miles in Los Angeles, if you're familiar with it, is like a two-hour difference between one side to the other side, right? Uh, could yeah. be a lot more uh, depending on what day and what time you're traveling. Like Friday afternoon, you're screwed. Um, but let's say right. if you're talking about going to a uh, – uh, if you're buying a property, I, I just closed on a property today in Florida, right? So no restraints. They were very happy to sell the property. Yeah. So – which is pretty wicked. One yeah. thing I've been holding in my uh, in my pocket for a while, Angel, I was prospecting a client or a prospect maybe a year ago. Um, and it was some gentleman who owned a condo in uh, Jersey City area. And as I was talking to him, he started talking to me about DADUs, ADUs. And then he mentioned a name that sounded familiar. He said, oh yeah, you know, there's this realtor in California. His name is Angel Garcia. And uh, he, he has this really good niche where it's like, if you own a 40 by 100 lot, he can help facilitate like a dad do or an ADU. So I know that you went from the real estate business to a niche with the flip business locally for dad do's and ADUs, which was something that wasn't publicly known, but was a massive value add almost instantly. Yeah. If you were able to identify it. I know that sounds extremely creepy that I know that, but you know. Who, who was it that you spoke with? <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the name later, but it was pretty, he only spoke very, he spoke very highly of you. Okay, um, well, that's and then nice. You Thank realize you. that you could do so much more with scale, which yeah. is pretty insane. Well, I think just for, for the record, if you could explain to, you know, to, to people out there what, what exactly those are, um, mm -hmm. the difference and how you got into that niche. Yeah, so that was a really interesting uh, niche. Um, we jumped on it like really early on. I think we had one of the very first permits that were pulled in all of LA County for that specific niche. Um, I believe it was uh, late 2017, right around there. Um, but basically what happened is Los Angeles is so dense and there's such a lack of housing, like there isn't many major markets. Um, LA being, again, one of the largest markets, um, the city made a rule that you can now add and, and will basically turn your house into a duplex. But it's not a duplex. It doesn't go in the same requirements, uh, permitting requirements and uh, and, and it, the same type of hurdles that you would have to jump through to do a duplex. It was a lot easier. It's called an accessory dwelling unit. 
also known as granny flat. Um, there's all these different terms that they have for them, right? Uh, In-law suite, whatever, right? So these different units that you can build were in super high demand, right? Because it allows people to do multiple different things, offset their mortgage or allows them to, you know, have a space for mom or have a space for a family member or for guests, whatever. Um, and we saw the opportunity, we jumped on it. So we experimented with it. We converted a, a garage into a unit, which you can do that with the ADU laws. You can do it with the, you can do a garage conversion or you can build additional square footage, like from the ground up. Um, and at right, first, so you can literally add a second structure yeah. in someone's backyard. Completely. 1,200 square feet, four bedroom, three bedrooms, whatever you can fit in there. Um, usually the more bedrooms, the better. But it was very experimental. It was very risky. The biggest issue was that we didn't have comps. So the first one that we did, we just closed off a side through a kitchen in, and then we made an extra, you know, 70 grand. And I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. So um, it was, you know, we're trying to like dipping our toes into it. And then we started like after that one, it was like, okay, let's, let's, let's do this for real. And the biggest issue we kept running into is that there was no comparables. Right. So, um, once comparables started to show up, then we started doing two bedrooms and three bedrooms and then four bedrooms and really taking full advantage. Then they allowed it for multifamily units. So you can do a, a certain percentage of the density, uh, that allows you to build additional units. Right. So let's say if you have, uh, 10 units that'll let you build, let's say an additional two or three units, right? Um, and then they added a junior ADU. Um, and that one, same thing, we jumped on it right away. So it was a, you now have your two units and they allowed you to tr do a junior ADU that's oh, that's a, a limited, I think 600 square feet. Um, yeah. And then that was really profitable as well. That's really how we started taking advantage of like flipping in our market because it was also very competitive, but it was just a competitive edge where people weren't catching on just yet. And it was a little bit more risky, but it allowed us to like, it, we just knew that it was going to work because people needed them. At worst case, yeah. we would take them on. Another piece that we actually took advantage of at that time was that we actually started doing them, like putting them on Airbnb. And that was still pretty new, right? But we were like really lucky we started holding on to properties as rentals in LA, which usually doesn't make sense, which is something that I talk to you guys about all the time. Um, Cause yeah. LA is, you know, the, the return on investment for, you know, your down payment and stuff like that is like terrible. Yeah. Right. Um, but when you add a different unit, it really starts to make a lot more sense. And especially with uh, Airbnb, I have one two bedroom unit right now that I get about 7,500 bucks a month um, on a two bedroom unit in uh, here in LA. Um, why that specific unit just because of how you renovated it no the location. airbnb is awesome airbnb is awesome yeah. and uh and it it is in a decent location is near a university so it helps a little bit but they airbnb changed some rules so we had to get rid of a lot of the properties that we had and you can only have one airbnb unit as an investor you can't have multiple so i got rid of a bunch of different properties that i was holding because of that and that's when i just started going out of state and it was because I had the gotcha. confidence that knowing that I can go ahead and rent on Airbnb and, and get higher returns on my investment. And that was what took me there. But then I ended up doing something completely different, obviously. <laughs> so it, real quick, when, when you, what, is it fair to say that when you guys, because the comps were limited, is it fair to say that when you were looking at a property as a potential acquisition, that, that the idea of doing the ADU would be like additional revenue? And the, you know, the main structure had to make sense for you to do it because you didn't necessarily know how much more it was going to bring. We made sense of it as a rental first because I had no idea how much it was going to be able to sell for up on the market. And, but I did know that people were paying above asking and they were paying above appraisal and everything else. So we said, all right, so worst case, we keep it as a rental It pencils. Best case, yeah. we're going to make an extra 70 grand. Well, very quickly when people started realizing what they were and people started looking for them, then we started getting a hundred thousand, a hundred and fifty thousand, and then then we started to really understand. Okay, now we know how much people are willing to pay for these, and then they started going wildfire. Everybody started doing them, um, so now they're super common. All of California now allows it, which is awesome. That's a new uh, rule, and they also did a junior ADU. They also just passed a new one that other people aren't catching on to just yet, which is they're allowing subdivisions of properties. So lots uh, are now much easier to subdivide than they used to be. So these are all mm -hmm. different things that are happening in California that have created a lot more opportunity than there was in the past. However, I found a better opportunity that I enjoyed a little bit more that was uh, still lower risk, but had great margin and better scale uh going out of state 
yeah, which is right. what we were initially talking about. I think it's only fair to just touch upon one thing real quick, too, because a lot of people probably listening to this are saying, well, like Hero said in the beginning, you know, it does sound like it's going to be a lot more work doing an actual rehab of a property. Uh, tell us about your structure with your father. I mean, he runs the construction side of things. And, you know, how did how did COVID impact thing when, things when, when obviously construction materials went through the roof? COVID helped. Um, so, again, uh, I think... Um, We've taken on a lot of uh, risk at times, right? Um, where it was like, for example, getting into an ADU, not knowing that anybody would pay any extra for it. We just had to figure out a way to pencil it out for worst case scenario. And that was the key. And then with COVID, um, our biggest thing was the reputation. Well, my dad and I basically said, well, look, we, we're already under contract in escrow in March, uh, closing on a bunch of properties. We got other properties. Um, worst case is we'll put them for rent and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll grit our teeth, bite, fight through it. And we'll, we'll be all right. You know, if they, if we can't sell these properties, we'll finish them up quickly, refinance them and just hold on to them for the long term. And we figured that, you know, the, obviously the interest rates are low and we th we were thinking that they were going to get lower because of what was going on with COVID. Um, and then we were thinking like, yeah, okay, the way that the market might fi fix itself is maybe with more strategic lending options, which is exactly what ended up happening. So we got really lucky, but either way, we were going to move forward with them because we wanted to protect our reputation in the area. Cause a lot of the deals that we get is because people trusted us to be able to perform and they knew what we were looking for. So if all of a sudden we canceled on, you know, seven or eight properties that we were purchasing at the time, that would really hurt our reputation. Um, especially sure. with a couple of the people that we work with regularly. So um, my dad what? handles everything in the construction side of things. Um, that was one of your questions. Um, he basically does everything project management. My, my, my deal was basically I find them, uh, find them, fund them, and sell them. Yep. It's, it's, it's interesting that you guys have sort of each taken a different role in the business. So is it – walk us through – Obviously, you're doing transactions throughout the country. Like you said, you just closed on something in Florida. But a California, a local transaction, walk us through the steps. You identify the property. You send him out there. He you know, he prices it out for you, gets you to the numbers. You plug them into your sheet. How does all that work? Uh, no. Well, basically, I, I know the numbers. I, I know what it costs to complete a project. Um, I know what it would cost us to do an ADU and to do everything else. So I'll just you know, put it on a contract. You know, And once we... Once we have it under contract, then we then we figure out what the floor plan is going to look like and everything else. Um, but the biggest thing is just putting the deal under contract and getting it. And then we we figure out who we're going to have our financing with. What ended up happening is um, we, we've made really good deals with uh, a lot of our lenders as well, um, like, like very favorable terms that allowed us to scale as well. Um, and, you know, as far as the whole process, like from beginning to end, as I identify a deal, we put it under contract with either myself or one of my team members from the real estate team. Right. And then, and I taught my buyer's agents how to identify deals and how to, how to do numbers on them. They'll negotiate them. Um, I gave them our price sheets as far as what it's going to cost to do certain things, right. Um, per square feet. And then they already had a good idea as far as where they needed to be at in order to, to make sure that it was a deal. So yeah. when we would get involved with it, it was basically once we already had a commitment that we're getting this property, um, and then, and then I would get involved. And then once we have it under contract, then, uh, you know, we'll go get plans done with our plans guys. And my dad will come by too. And also kind of figure out my dad's a whiz when it comes to like figuring out how he's going to set up the floor plan. He's really good at like, you know, knowing which walls need to come down and which walls need to come up and how to get stuff like that done. And then we have a, uh, a, uh, designer, like a decorator, I'm sorry, that'll work with us to make sure that we have all of the design, like, uh, like color palettes and stuff like that, like what what color we're going to be doing with the flooring, what color we're going to be doing with this side. She doesn't talk to like she she her role is nothing to do with like the actual like floor plans, right? We set up the floor she, plan, we'll figure it out. Actually, my dad sets up the floor plan, right? I don't touch the floor plans. My dad touches everything floor plans and then gets the job to completion. When we once we get to the finishes, she gets involved and says, "Okay, we're going to do a wine closet here, right? We're going to do a um, you know, this color scheme over here, so on. She completely, and it was funny because that hurt my dad's feelings a little bit that she was so much better at it than he was. <laughs> He's like, that's not something I wanted to let go. As you were talking about that process, I'm just thinking if this were me and my father, he'd be like, um, how much is the budget for this? Yeah. You've totally messed up that, that, uh, that analysis and you should back out of the deal. I love it. But 
real quick, I want to take a step back. The the one thing that um, I, that was very clear, and it almost brought in a, a memory. One of my mentors in the past told me that real estate's beautiful because it's the only industry that insider trading is legal. You can have knowledge that you can take advantage of, and no one can do anything about it. And that's the best part of it. Is it fair to assume, Angel, that that niche of the ADU and DADUs having the knowledge in advance gave you the capacity that you needed to feel comfortable with scaling a wholesale business? Well, here, here's the thing. Like we didn't, it, it wasn't even insider trading because we didn't know before it passed. We just found out when it passed, right? Because we, when it passed, we, we went at it, but. But it wasn't common knowledge. So it, that's the biggest thing. Yeah, it wasn't common knowledge. It was taking advantage of like things when they're new and fresh, right? Um, and same thing that I feel like I'm doing right now as I'm scaling out, right? Like I think it's kind of like a taboo in a sense or kind of weird to be touching into multiple different markets and then doing flips in, in a different uh, state where, you know, it just, it's just different. Right. Um, yeah. So it's uh, writing, writing whatever wave is available at the moment. Right now it's been the ADUs. Then now it's going to be the, then it became the junior ADUs right now. It's going to be the lot splits. Um, this is specifically yep. for LA. The next one, I think as the market starts to go in a downturn is going to be land. I think land is going to be the biggest opportunity out there. Um, and it's just because it has the highest, uh, variance when it comes to pricing, right? It dips the lowest and then also raises the fastest once the market gets good again. So, um, but yeah, uh, information is the key. It, like, that's why I spend so much on going out to go get information, right? Like I, yeah. I go all across the country. I find the who's who of like whatever niche I want to learn about. And then I try to gobble up as much information as I can about that specific niche because information is everything. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to us about the deal you just closed on today in Florida. Like, how did you find the opportunity? Was it your team? How did you, you know, feel comfortable about the pricing? You know, what's the particular strategy on that one? Yeah. 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 So that one was really interesting. That was a, that was a pain in the butt. Um, but that property uh, was a cold call. Uh, we called the seller um, and he explained the situation. He had uh, he had this property that he has an investment property. He got divorced from his wife. His wife was actually still living in the property. The property was beat up. Um, and we went through all kinds of issues and just trying to get them to work it out to actually sell the property. Um, I ended up getting the property. Uh, more, more and more things kept coming up. The seller kept lying about different situations with the property. He said that he was, uh, that the, the wife had no rights to the property, right? Turns out that she did. So that was a that was a big hurdle that we had to jump through. It took about a month or so to to get them to agree to to a settlement there. Um, he also said that there was no, that solar was paid off. There was solar panels on the property, and it was supposed to be paid off. It wasn't paid off at all. Like he had just put it on like a week ago, like right <laughs> before we got under contract. I'm like what? Why would you even lie about that? Like like you know this stuff is gonna come up, right? Like it doesn't just disappear. Um, so that, it was that. So we had to renegotiate the price. Basically, I ended up getting the property for a hundred and thirteen. Uh, property resale value is around two forty. Um, so it was a we got it at a great price. Needs a lot of work. Um, once the and and the other thing was that I had I was supposed to get the property vacant. Uh, he the wife moved out, but the son didn't, and the son was a crackhead squatter, wouldn't get out of the property. So he started, you know, beating up the property, taking plumbing out, taking the AC out, all this different stuff. So that took another month. And then we were able to get the police to get him out and, uh, you know, board it up. But anyways, we every time that that stuff would happen, we'd had to re come back and renegotiate the price because of all the additional issues that would come up and come up and come up. Um, we ended up getting the property at 113. Again, the property is worth uh, somewhere in the range of 240 to 250 after everything's been repaired at that at, at top dollar, right? Um I basically, by the time that I got to closing, which I closed on it to purchase it actually uh, last week, this is actually the sale of it now uh, that I'm closing on today. Um, so I think I said I bought it. No, I, I, I purchased it last week, but I'm, I'm selling it this week. Um, gotcha. And the reason that it happened so quickly is because basically what I did is as soon as I closed on it, I said, let me put this thing up for sale. Or actually before I even uh, uh, sold it, I was already like, talking to people to see if anybody would be interested in taking it from me. And the reason is, is because I am completely through with it. The, the squatters kept jumping into the property. So I had boarded it up. And then I also had some issues with one of my contractors out there specific to that neighborhood. So I didn't want to, I don't, didn't want anything to do with it. So I went ahead and accepted a contract 
the the day before I closed on it, I had already signed a contract with a buyer to buy it from me for this week. For how uh, much? So it was a, in one week, and uh, I ended up selling it for one fifty. So that's awesome. Gotcha. Yeah. Congratulations. So, so yeah. I've a, I guess I have a couple questions after that. So you said you know you ended up having issues with the squatter and the property. You had to board it up. Obviously, you're in California. This is in Florida. You have boots on the ground there. Is this your contractor? You know who was helping you through all those steps of the process? I had my attorney uh, help me out with it uh, to get the people out, and then he sent a runner out there. But once we had to board up the property and everything else, that was the contractor. Um, but the contractor that I had uh, was behind on a different project, so I knew that this one wasn't going to get touched for a while. And I was just concerned that if the property stays vacant for too long, that I'm going to get squatters in there again, and I'm going to have to go through the whole mess. And I had to get squatters out of there, just for the record, three times before wow. it even closed. And it was because the seller kept leaving the front door open, and he wouldn't board wow. it up. So I just, <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. But you asked about the most interesting deal I've had in a, in a, in a, in a minute, so... That's yeah. the story with it. But, I, but, <laughs> so, but luckily, I was able to make profit quickly. And I'm happier to doing that right now just because the market's also in an interesting place. So, yeah. so I think the other thing that comes to mind, too, is um, we all know, you know the interesting tactics we could use with the wholesale process. What was the, the thought process of actually closing on that property? Like, Why not actually just assign the contract? Um, well, I was going to make a lot more money. You know? That's, but it always comes down to the, how it pencils out. You know, the, the risk was worth the reward. Um, there wasn't very much risk. The property also pencils out great as a rental. Um, it's in Orlando. And, uh, you know, if I can get 240, 250 with it, you know, you know, when I penciled it all out, it just made more sense. So then, yeah. but by the time that I got to the end, it no longer made sense. Like I, and more of just like, the stress that was coming on from it just cause I was so, uh, annoyed after such a long time with the squatters. But I also knew that I, I could, like, if I wasn't a wholesale it, I couldn't, uh, wholesale it for a price that I wanted to get, uh, if I had the squatters and if I was selling it with the squatters in there. So I had to get the squatters out anyways, but right. Cause that, that added value, of course. Yeah. yeah. Angel, can you share some of the infrastructure that's needed to actually scale an operation like that? What are the key roles that you need? So that way you can be able to do something thousands of miles away. Um, well, do you mean like to what what so part you have of the business? Acquisitions. Yeah, so acquisitions. All right, well, to acquire properties in a different marketplace, uh, I mean, obviously, number one is that you need sales, right? You need sales. You need marketing, right? Marketing to the area. You need salespeople to get the property under contract. And then you have to have... Uh, exit strategies. Exit strategies can be a wholesale, it can be a flip, or it can be just, uh, you, they call it wholetail, which is basically just buy it and it's as this condition and then put it on the market. That's been a lot of my strategy currently because it's very easy to uh, sell a property on the MLS and then get a great dollar for it, right? When you're wholesaling, you're selling to very small percentage of people. That's why I don't do too much wholesale. Most of what I do is actually like on the market, okay. it'll go either a hotel or I'll sell to institutional uh, companies, large uh, investment firms like uh, hedge funds, for example. Um, and that's been a big portion of uh, what I'll do to maximize my proceeds on a, on a transaction. That's smart. So instead of actually having to have like a buyer's list or coordinate any kind of uh, walkthrough or negotiations, you're basically just closing on it, putting it right back on the market with a professional and then you're done. Yeah, but I, I, I still have a list. Like I have a very large list of buyers um, in multiple different markets, all the markets that I'm in, obviously. Um, but nothing ever beats the MLS, you know? The only thing is, is that it does take more time and then sometimes I don't get too much more money. Like in some cases, like if I have a clean property that just fits the, the buy boxes really well for some of the buyers that I have, um, these are buyers that are usually looking for cap rate returns, then I, I can get the same amount that I can get going on the market versus, you know, versus just selling it to them right away. So I can literally, in many cases, sell it to them the same day that I close on it. Like, for example, yesterday, um, I closed on a different property where I bought it and sold it in the same exact day, right? Mm. So within 30 minutes apart, right? Um, and that's because I, I was selling it to an institutional buyer. Um, and then that, that property, I netted $50,000 on it. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah. So it's it, those are th those will be like different examples of like different exit strategies, right? So like that exit strategy is going to be different than let's say going on the MLS, but it's still yeah. in the sense where I, I to buy it, right? I have to close on it, but I get my money back literally the same day, right? So yeah, money That's in, awesome. money out. Let's take a second and talk about the mentors. So you've been lucky enough to be around mentors and seek out different mentors to to be able to take advantage of the opportunities of these emerging. Uh, Things and uh, I know John told me in the past that you had exposure to Jim Rohn. Yeah, yeah, Jim Rohn is uh, definitely like one of the most impactful people in in my life. Um, and I had so the only difference is I read his books and his quotes online, and but you you've met actually him. met him and and grew up around him. Well, not necessarily grew up around them. It was so much. So here's what happened, right? Um, the brokers that I work at uh, has a guy named Joe Alexander. And Joe Alexander is an amazing individual. He's freaking awesome. He is uh, he is a child of Jim Rohn, right? Like not his actual child, but he literally damn well should be. I mean, the guy's he's hired him to come out and speak to, at his office multiple different times. He got very close. He actually spoke, uh, at his funeral. Right. So, um, he's, he was very, very close and that's how I gained proximity to him. Um, it was through Joe. Joe is a, you know, he owns a real estate brokerage and is also uh, related to a very wealthy family. Um, the Malouf family, uh, they had the Kings and then the, the palms in Vegas. Right. Um, that's that those are his cousins. Uh, and, he has proximity to a lot of uh, wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people, people that you would like know, right? Um, Jim Rohn being one of them. And Jim Rohn, like that was his mentor. That was his direct mentor. Joe mentored me and my dad and then also gave us proximity to Jim Rohn. Like I've got pictures of me as a kid with Jim Rohn, which is, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I, I feel very grateful that I, I got that opportunity. Um, but as a kid, like eight years old, like I've got like books and books and books filled with like uh, just notes and notes and notes all on my Jim Rohn journals. They're like the little black journals. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're like gold, uh, gold yeah. uh, paper lining. And it's just, it's awesome. And you look through them and I'm like, oh. and it's funny because I'll think back to them. I'm like, what, what could an eight year old write uh, at that time? And I'll look <laughs> at the notes. Um, everything's misspelled. <laughs> but, but I had some good notes in there and I'm like, man. I wonder what type of impact that actually had on me. Who knows specifically what type of impact, but like sp like specific right to what may have led me to do certain things. But I can tell you is that it, it very aggressively changed the way that I thought. Um, mm. I it it changed the way that I would look at certain things. It would it inspired me to to go after bigger things, and it always kept things simple for me, right? Because Jim Rohn has a very simple way of teaching. Right. He's like, you want to be like somebody else and just walk like him, talk like him. And then soon enough, you'll start being like him. Right. Like there's certain things. Come on. That... Can you say that in the Jim Rohn voice? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't even try it on here. I got to practice it first. Yeah. That's awesome. Any That's any memories that stand out of your exposure um, or your proximity to Jim Rohn? Um. Not, n nothing in particular. Honestly, the, uh, the the stuff that always stands out most are some of like his signature speeches, right? Like I have memories where, you know, he, he would come out and it wasn't like I had where I'm, you know, like I wasn't ever at his house or anything like that. It wasn't that type of exposure. My exposure was still stage exposure where he was just coming on that stage, similar to how we would go sit in front of Mike Ferry. And then we get proximity, we go over and shake his hand, talk to him a little bit, you know, get a little bit, maybe a couple of minutes every now and then maybe, you know grab a cup of coffee or something. It was that simple, right? Um, but it was just so impactful. And I remember thinking that he was like, uh, to me, he was like the biggest celebrity out there, right? Like that's how much of an impact it was. Like there was uh, someone that you have like, uh, that you get starstruck with. That was Jim Rohn to me. I was like, oh my God, it's Jim Rohn, right? Like I, I freaked out, like completely freaked out. Um, and I remember him, like he would reach out and he was older at the time, right? And reach out and his hands were like really big. And I remember thinking, I was like, oh my gosh, this is cool. I just touched Jim Rohn's hand. I'm never going to wash my hand. Right? Like, <laughs> so, but That's uh, awesome, man. yeah, I freaked out completely. So eight years old exposure to Jim Rohn. Yeah. That's yeah. Who else was a mentor figure for you that you had exposure to or proximity to? 
Um, I mean, there's tons of mentors, right? Like you got Mike Ferry, um, Aaron Novello. Uh, there's, uh, you know, Tony Robbins. Um, there's, and I've, I signed up for coaching programs with basically all of these guys, right? And uh, um, my, my dad, my dad's probably my biggest mentor of all time, right? Because he's always there, as I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's the same for a lot of people, right? Like uh, dad's the one that actually walks you over. Uh, to meet all these different people, put all these ideas, tells you the one that, hey, man, you can do this. Um, and, you know, there's there's mentors for everything. Like I'm, I'm hiring mentors all the time, even right now for the investment side of things, right? Um, and the biggest thing is always trying to become best friends with them in a sense. Right? Not try to become best friends inauthentically, but just find ways to where you can get closer. So usually you have to buy it, right? You have to buy proximity sometimes. But once you're in, then you get their personal numbers and then, you know, go grab a bite with them. Go it's a shortcut from there. Yeah, that's just fun and easy. Yeah, then, the, and you know that's that's what's interesting about this whole podcast too, right? Like it it um, by us creating this platform, it's given us a lot of proximity to to people like yourself and and uh, you know people at all ends of the spectrum, right? So it's it's kind of interesting, like you know, the the power of proximity and, and bringing people into your network. Is there anybody else recently that you've, um, you know, either gone to an event that they've hosted, um, you know, just by being in their proximity, it's impacted your wholesaling or flipping business? Uh, Carlos Reyes is another guy that's also really big. Sean Terry is another guy that's also really big. Um, those guys have been uh, really helpful. There's another guy by the name of Rafael Vargas. Um, these are all guys that I've paid for mentorships. Um, and to gain uh, proximity to, and it and it's cool because like uh, next week, like Sean Terry is one of the biggest guys in the uh, in the industry for the investment space, and I'm gonna be speaking with him. <laughs> so that's, that's gonna be with uh, yeah, like uh, next week. So awesome! It's just uh, you, you start gaining proximity and and with your masterminds and with other things to where it's like this is uh, this it, you get you. You get close to them to where you can really get the nuts and bolts of everything that you really need to build your business, right? Yeah. And then it just, it, it becomes, sometimes you start feeling like you get good ideas that just come to you, but it's not, they just come to you. It's not that you're, uh, yeah. you know, any sharper than anybody else. It's literally just that you've gotten proximity to enough people to where they probably told you it like 10 times and all of a sudden you wake up one day and like, oh, I have a great idea. It's, you know, <laughs> let me do this, you know? Yeah. You know, it's funny. We were talking about it this morning and John was making fun of me. He was like, you know, Kiro, <clears throat> I wouldn't say he's gullible. I would say he's impressionable because if you told him, hey, drink this drink, you'll jump 10 feet. It he'll wasn't, do it. It wasn't like, high noon, by the way. I'm like, yeah, it's a high noon. Sponsor us, please. Um, but yeah, I, I would do it. So <clears throat> I almost feel like you're the same way. You know, I went to one Tony Robbins event and then he pitched the bio cybernaut thing, which is like you get locked in a, a cave for like a week in Sedona, Arizona. It's a shitload of money. But I was like, I have no idea what it's about. I'm going to go. <laughs> are you the same way or are you calculated with those uh, investments in yourself? Well, I, I'm usually very specific about what I want to get. So I'm uh, usually, I, I try not to let things kind of that are in passing get in my way to influence what I, what, what I feel like I need. I'll take time for myself to really like, like almost meditation, right? Like for me, meditation is going on a really long run or you know, just getting a day by myself where nobody can influence my thoughts or anything like that, or, and then what will happen is I'll start thinking about the things that I need or ideas that, that I would like to implement. And then there are certain times where all of a sudden you get some inspiration and you realize like, this is the direction that I need to do. And it's after doing like a full, real, like honest assessment about what's going on in your business and in your life. And then I go seek that information. So I find, and my biggest thing, it's like a rule. It's kind of like a, I, I always look for who is the biggest guy in the space and how can I learn that specific skill? Example would be, let's say, um, if you want to learn wholesale, find the biggest guy in that space and go get information directly from that guy. Um, if you want to do, you know, be a real estate agent, find the biggest guy in that space and then all, and real estate, like, because I'm imagining that a lot of your uh, audience is likely realtors, right? Um, I'll give you a, a, a realtor specific example. If you want to work on skills, 
then there's certain coaches that you can focus on on specifically just communication and talking to clients, right? There are certain coaches that you can talk to about building systems and processes for your business, and then you go get information from them for that. If you want to learn about, let's say, specific strategies, there are certain coaches that are very specific to that. So I, I try to identify who's who, right? I'll give you an example. Mike Ferry, probably not the best guy to talk to about relationships or, uh, you know, <laughs> like... Uh, Marriage advice, marriage advice, or yeah. you know, how to <laughs> I, a lot of different little funny things like that. Um, but there's a lot of amazing things that you can get from him too. He's built an amazing business, and then he's also one of the you know most relentless prospectors that you'll ever meet. And then screams it from the top of his lungs, right? Um, accountability, best you know, best guy out there in the business for it. Then you've got people that are more systems oriented, like let's say like a like Lars. Lars Hennenborg is probably one of the best systems guys out there. Um, you got Aaron. Aaron, that's uh, big on uh, content creation and also on skill building, right? Like uh, he's he's very skillful. Um, but there's getting specific information for specific things that you need in your business. If you notice that you're lacking in this, that your numbers are real weak here, then that's where that that's that's the bottleneck in your business. If there's, you know, if you look at your entire business as a like, if you break down your entire business to like ratios or numbers, whatever your weakest number is. Find the guy, find mm -hmm. the guy that crushes that specific ratio, right? Whether it be, let's say an example would be uh, generating leads, right? Who's the guy that's the best at lead generation? Who's the guy that's the best? If you find out your bottleneck is actually on contract to close, then who's the guy that's best for like admin stuff? Who's the guy that's the best for listing presentation? Who's the guy that's best for team building, right? I just don't have enough people, right? Um, mm -hmm. Who's the guy? That's always the question. Yeah, I think that's really helpful advice. So talk to us great. a little bit about your team structure. Um, how many people do you have, you know, sourcing deals? How many acquisitions people do you have? Uh, do you have like a closing team? Yeah. How, how many people are behind the operation? Um, I got it. So my biggest set and my biggest team, you guys know that I do a lot of my business from cold calling. I've got 36 cold callers right now. Um, wow. So those are scattered throughout everywhere except for the united states <laughs> right? Good like, for you. They're, they're all over the place um but that would be the largest set right but they're lead generation so i would consider that a marketing cost um and then i have uh so i have like an opener closer model right so i have a team that opens the conversations with the seller and then i have a team that closes the conversation closing meaning getting a contract signed so the, I have 36 cold callers, right, as my main lead source. I have other lead sources as well, but that would be the big chunk, a big majority, obviously, as you might have imagined with the, the size of them or the amount of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have my internal guys. I have six guys that are focusing on closing contracts for my investment business. Um, I got three guys in my retail, residential, resale. Um, and then those, these guys would all be considered closers, right? Um, they focus on getting contracts. Um, they're all able to work on the investment side. They're not all able to work on the retail side because of licensing. Um, sure. and as far as like my admin team, um, I've got, uh, they, I have admin that handles different things. I, let me see. I've got, I've got about six people in admin. Um, you know, the half of them virtual, right. And then, uh, Data management is part of admin, right? They consider that part of our admin. I have one person that's dedicated just to data. Um, I have one person that's, uh, I have two different transaction coordinators, one for the retail side, one for the uh, investment business. I have uh, just general admin and then, actually, you know what, I have seven people because I, I just hired somebody else for uh, our dispositions, which is uh, our exit strategies. What they do is they're in charge of basically looking at the properties and figuring out what the best exit strategy is based off of the standard operating procedures that I've created. So they use my operating procedure and they'll look at the deals and scan through them, look at everything from Airbnb rents to market rents to how much it's gonna cost to repair the property, right, based off of our sheets. And then they'll make a decision on does it make sense to wholesale, hotel, flip, rent, Airbnb, et cetera. Wow. Much that, et cetera. Wow. That's it, basically. So, you know, we have an outbound calling team as well, not nearly as big as yours. Uh, 36 people. Why 36? Um, and do they, 
you know, do six of them focus on Florida or six of them focus on, you know, absentee owners or foreclosure? How do you figure out who focuses on what, who, you know, who's, who's coaching these guys up, role playing, that sort of thing? That's a good question. So, um, the, as far as like, who's in charge of what market and stuff like that, there is no separation by market. Um, they are in all markets because the script is exactly the same. The way that I've designed my, my business is that every single team member can hit every single market. Um, the way that we have it set up is we have geo targeted or geo, uh, set up phone numbers where as long as I'm calling, if I'm calling into this area, then it's using the number, the phone numbers that we have for this specific area. Um, that's going to be on the openers and on the closers, right? Um, I've talked, had many conversations with dialers, uh, with you guys and you guys understand how that, that function works. Um, sure. and the, as far as like, uh, who coaches them up and stuff, um, originally it was me. Then I was able to delegate that off. Um, I guess I didn't really count that person either, but they're a, they're a manager. And then I also didn't count a quality control rep. So I, I have two other VAs that, uh, one of them that does management, um, and one of them that does, uh, uh, the, the uh, quality Coaching. control, quality control is a gotcha. very big, uh, position in my company as well, because a lot of, uh, they, I, we have a requirement, right? They have to bring in a certain number of leads, uh, and to hit their quota. Um, the cold callers, you know, if they don't, sometimes they'll get pressured and then they'll just start submitting some crap. So yeah. quality control is in place to make sure that they're not submitting just anything. But at the end of the day, I tell them to basically submit anything that has a true pulse on it, but you know, true pulse is opinion sometimes, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. so what's your definition of a lead these days? Someone that has a motivation, a reason for selling, and then someone that's selling, uh, within a certain price and then has a time frame. Um, yeah. so price, motivation, and time frame. The only three things yeah. I care about. As long as they can answer those three, um, and price is a little bit more flexible, uh, even though I'm an investment company, the reason price is a little bit flexible is because I don't expect them to be able to negotiate, right? My cold callers are very low skilled, right? They're just asking basic questions based on, and they're following a simple script and they're just taking down notes. And if someone just answers it, in a, it the questions correctly, then they now make it over to my closing team, which they are the ones that will negotiate. But the qualification of a lead is just, do they have a motivation? Do they have a price that's within range? Um, yeah. And then uh, do they have a time frame? Yeah. You know, you were that guy for us when you were saying earlier, find that guy in that space, you know, and you were being humble about it because you helped us tremendously with that system of it. We went from having a 1% answer rate, meaning that out of every 100 people our outbound callers would call, one person would answer, to having a 3% transfer rate. So meaning out of every 100 people they call, they're transferring over three people as opportunities. So just being able to find the right people in the right space helps growth tremendously. And that um, was due to proximity to Angel. Yeah, 100%. And everything was just, you know, sponged up and it's, yeah, that, I 100% agree. That's uh, that's one of my biggest takeaways from this. Yeah, this optimization scenario. is huge, man. Optimization is huge when it comes to. I didn't know that it was that that uh, large the difference there. Um, yeah. But I did notice the same thing for us at some point, but it's because we were really struggling. But the connection rate, right? The number of people that we were calling, and then also the uh, like just how we were managing the data that we were handling made a, yeah. all the difference in the world. And we talked about how we tear out the data and stuff like that, which is a very technical and analytical conversation that might put your audience to sleep, but um, optimization is key. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what's next for you? I mean, are you expanding into different markets? Um, you don't have to necessarily share which markets you're looking at, but um, is there a goal to be in X number of markets yeah. and, and keep implementing the same strategy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you which markets I'm in right now, um, or at least uh, states, because I'm in multiple markets within states, right? Uh, major markets only for the most part. Um, I'm in Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and uh, Tennessee. Um, and those are the five main markets. Um, I was in a couple of different markets, but I pulled back because I found that I was getting a, like my best results from these five. And there's multiple markets with in these, right? So like, for example, Florida, you got Tampa, and then you also got Jacksonville, right? You got Orlando, right? So there's three right there, three different markets within one state. Um, so technically more markets, but 
I'm breaking markets up into states. Now I'm also expanding into uh, the, I've got my eyes right now on Texas and uh, Arizona. The reason I haven't done it yet, even though those are great markets is because the it's easier because all the properties are the same like builds for the most part. You got a lot of like brick style homes, uh, you know, wood frame homes. So it just keeps the, the process the same. The price points are all about the same. Um, so comps are that much easier. It's it, the, the comps in all markets are easy because the that's I'm, I'm specifically targeting areas where it's all similar type homes. Right. So that way it doesn't complicate my process. All of a sudden, if I have to start changing up the types of homes that I'm looking at, then it changes up the entire model and the underwriting for my team. So it allows me to stay simple. Same thing I've done with the cold calling. The reason and I didn't even answer your question earlier. The reason that I went up to 36 cold callers is because I have an option. Right. I can start putting money into different marketing channels. I am phenomenal and I will and I will say that uh, with confidence, I'm great when it comes to cold calling. I understand data, I understand the phone numbers, I understand the calling of it, I did it for a long time. I understand the conversations that need to be held, I understand the qualifications, right? Like I, I, I get cold calling, right? Um, if I have to learn how to do a different marketing strategy, right? Like a, a digital marketing strategy, for example, digital marketing is gonna be a complete different animal, they get handled differently, everything is different about it, right? Um, right. aside from, you know, the goal is to get a contract signed. Right. But I'd rather scale, or if I have the opportunity to the one marketing channel, as far as I can get it. Right. Yep. Um, without having to change too many other systems. The only thing I had to change for these other markets was literally the phone numbers. Right. I, I did, I need different people. Right. But that's not that difficult when you realize that the, the process is exactly the same as long process is harder to change than people. Right. Yeah. I don't have to change the process at all as long as everything else is the same. Well, you're doubling down or tripling down on what's working, right? Yeah. Like with Aaron and in our mastermind, what we were always talking about is attract, convert, and deliver, right? So you've really mastered the idea of attraction just through the phone, right? Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because a lot of people um, think that, you know, outbound calling is 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 old school. And I think that's that that could be a whole nother conversation in itself, right? Like I tell people, uh, friends that are in other industries, I'm like, yeah, we have an outbound calling team. They're like, dude, for real? Like, if I get a call from a number I don't recognize, I just don't answer it. I'm like, yeah, you don't. But uh, a lot of your, you know, a lot of other people do. Yeah. And like anything else, it's a numbers game. We just, you know, only need next number of people to answer. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm playing around with different things because, um, you know, there are, I, the reality is, is that you also do run out of geographical area as well. Um, especially when you start refining the data to really start hitting your target prospects, um, you'll still you, you do need to hit them up with different communication methods, right? So it's it's also how I'm processing data for like cold calls. Then it goes to like let's say direct mail for anything that we couldn't hit on the phone, right? Because you can get an export of people that just were never reachable, right? So it is true, right? Um, but that is just playing with data and then also refining and optimizing, but there's no need for optimization as long as you can spread geographically. So I've been taking advantage of geographical uh, scale before I've gone in and started adding different marketing channels, because when you add different marketing channels, you have, it does change up your process a little bit, right? Cause you get different lead types that require different types of approaches um, yeah. and different types of urgency, right? Like if you get an online lead, things need to go super, super fast, right? Someone needs to get back to them within like 30 seconds, right? Um, so, there's things that need to change and you want to max out, in my opinion, you have to max out the opportunity geographically and scale first, right? Like one marketing channel and then move over to the next one once you've basically extracted everything that you can out of it. And I'm kind of, I'm, I'm right there. I'm right on the edge as far as uh, what, what I can do with the cold calls, even with the spread yeah. that I'm hitting. And that's because, uh, again, uh, another tip I'll, I'll give for your audience real quick. Uh, the let's say for example if you can call a hundred thousand expireds all day long probably be doing a lot of business right but the reality yeah. is, is that the marketplace that you're in probably only has five a day none right? of them right yeah. or none and the ones that you do get are garbage right um right but if you went wide enough if you went nationwide and you started just calling expireds all day you'd probably be doing a ton of business because you'd be able to do three hours of solid phone calls with only the most motivated people out there right or because you've mastered the expired script because you've mastered the expired script you've mastered the phone call and really so here's the thing right so expired is a lead source it's not a marketing channel 
right? A marketing channel is how you're getting in touch with them. Cold calling, right? It could be direct mail. It could be online, right? That's the marketing channel. But then there's the lead source. The lead source is, let's say, expired for sale by owner or, uh, you know, absentee, whatever, right? So the lead source is one part of it. Marketing channel is another. I'm saying focus on one marketing channel and scale that out as much as you can and do it with the highest quality leads that you can get. My preference, again, is geographical, so it allows me to be on the phone with the hottest and most motivated leads throughout the country that are in yeah. target areas that I know doesn't change my process. Yeah. But to touch upon what you said, and, and it's obvious, uh, you can't go wide geography-wise on expires, right? Because our license, unless you want to get licensed in eight different states, which yeah. is just time-consuming and doesn't make any sense. But doing flips and, and uh, you know, wholesales, you don't have to be licensed. And a lot of people actually would prefer to not be licensed um, to, you know, dabble in those those areas. So yeah. well, it they, just goes to show. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I talk too much. It just man. goes to show. No, <laughs> dude, it's your job. I just love how excited he gets about it. No, it just goes to show that Angel's impatient because he literally found a niche, had a process and said, I don't want to wait for this to work in just this one area. I'm going to blow it out real, real quick. So that one niche geographically it just works out really well like you said you, you don't need a license if you're if a consumer is looking for an offer and you're saying hey i have an offer for you it's you easy don't need a thing. license to give somebody money you're not competing against anybody else it's just an easier delivery that's yeah. the end product that they're looking for and i think what you said there was interesting too is that online leads you know like because a lot of the people that we speak with other realtors people that are building teams team leaders spend an exorbitant exorbitant amount of money on zillow right but what they're buying is a lead source that needs to be called back instantly. And not only that, but that lead source is a lead source that everybody in the market has, right? So your people, you know, when it's off market and you're targeting people that are maybe in a troublesome point of their life, um, you know, I'm sure you have a little bit more time, right? Well, it doesn't have to be instant gratification. I'm sure there's other people swooping in on the deals, but, you know, uh, it's not the instant callback like uh, it's it's not the instant callback. Lines. I mean, we still get back to them as fast as we can, but there's just a it just it, it like we're talking about process, right? Because keep in mind that when the co caller is speaking to them, it was outbound. We we talked to them and we said you're going to get a callback, you know, within X amount of time from one of our team members, which gives us the liberty to be able to call them back. They know that they're they're going to get a phone call back, right? Now the you know, a PPC lead or a Zillow lead, right? Um, they need to be called back immediately and then they do end up in a lot of different hands. But so same thing with cold calls. But the biggest thing that you always hear about uh, with like PPC or with Zillow is that they're better quality leads, right? Well, it depends on how it was found and when you're getting it, right? Uh, with yeah, cold right. calls, the cool thing is, is that you can create your own qualification for that lead with your cold caller. So you can do it however you want. If you're, let's say, for example, if you're not really good at follow up, then have the cold callers handle more of the follow up, right? If right. you are good at follow up, then have them just generate the lead and then you take care of the rest. We found that for cold calls, we're, we're getting properties under contract within 14 to 16 days, which is very, very different than what it was cold calls for me in LA as a realtor. As a realtor, getting cold calls under contract actually was i think our average time was around about six months from when we would get a lead in yeah so that's very different than when you're buying a property um and why that is i tried figuring it out my thought is that you know when you're telling people they don't have to prepare their home for sale they don't have to worry about anything they can close on their timeline it's more attractive and it's easier for them to it's less for them to think about versus preparing their house for sale um, you know, going through the different options that they have, then also figuring out how well they're going to buy the next one. But if you let them know everything's on your timeline, you know, everything, you know, if this price makes sense to you, then all it is is now you figure out the rest is on the other end, right? Um, yeah. It allows people to transact much sooner. So a lot less follow-up required. Yeah, and I think the difference between what you're doing and like a Zillow or, you know, you know, even like sources like a home light or ideal agent, right? You're just doing all the nurturing in-house, right? People don't realize like Zillow's been nurturing that lead that they're paying that they're giving to you for the last three months, four months, and they're charging um, you for it too. They're charging, and they're charging you for it. Yeah, they're right? charging you an arm and a leg for it, right? Because a lot of them are referrals now, so they're charging you these uh, large referral fees um, for doing a good portion of the job there. But it makes it much tougher yeah. to scale 
But because I handle that for my team, then it allows me to be like, it allows my business to be much more profitable because I have a lot more margin to work with. Right. So because my business is so, um, delegated, right. And systemized my, my team members, I can pay them 10% and they'll be happy with that percentage versus let's say paying them 50%, you know, to transact a deal or whatever. Right. So it allows for a lot more profit, but I'm willing to put all these additional systems in place and create the follow-up systems and pay for the better CRMs and to create all the integrations, whatever we need to do to have an opportunity to number one, convert at higher levels when I'm in control of it, right? Cause it's systemized and also create the additional margin to create a better business, more scalable business. Yeah. But it also gives them the opportunity to be more efficient because now they can put way more deals together, right? Like one of my top guys, he got a, he got a, his, he's gotten 18 deals in a month. Um, over 10 deals is usually like, uh, like common for him. Um, but 18 yeah. deals in a month, I've never had one of my agents do that. So yeah, incredible. Shit. Well, I the biggest takeaway from that. <laughs> but, he, but think about it. It's, it goes back to what you said before, right? Like most times you have to nurture something six months before yeah. you can get it under contract. He's you know? doing it 17 times faster. So yeah. they're making 17 times more money because their time is 17 times more valuable. Yeah. From 180 days to 12 days. Yeah. I hope that math is right. <laughs> But that's that's pretty incredible. Angel, what are you doing in two weeks? In two weeks? Uh, is there a specific day? What, what are we talking about here? Yeah, I don't I don't know where he's you're going. Asking me on a date? He's going rogue. <laughs> 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 We're just so gonna happen to be in California. No, we need to we need to schedule something. That would be pretty cool to see how I think what he's saying is we'd love to come out and, and yes, spend some please, more time with forward. you and and uh, you know, dig into your operation a little bit deeper. Yeah, and man. time that makes sense for you, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we tried doing it last time, but as uh, you guys uh, you guys bailed on me, I'm saying it on air. I'm putting you guys on blast. <laughs> <laughs> well, we definitely need to reschedule that for sure. Yeah, I'm just messing with you but guys. Dude, but thank, yeah, of course. Always, always a pleasure spending time with you. We really yeah. do appreciate uh, you know all the the information you've provided us with, and uh, I think other people will really appreciate it and and realize that you know. Sometimes as an agent, we sort of feel confined to our little geographic area, but uh, you know, seeing someone like you scale so quickly and, and go wide geography wise, I think yeah. it's, it's uh, really impressive. I, I'm telling you, man, the, uh, the opportunity, the second that I was able to go in, uh, geographically wide, it changed everything, right? Like as a realtor, we were doing you know 10 deals a month, right? So just over a hundred, but my, my best month right now so far has been 42 deals in one month. That was in April, oh, shit, so man. The, it's night and day. That's only for the acquisition side. So there's yeah. a lot that you can do when you start thinking in scale. Geographical mm. specifically is my preference. I keep banging it in, so that's probably something that <laughs> <laughs> will stick, but um, yeah. Awesome, man. That's awesome, man. Awesome. Well, we, we feed off your excitement and uh, we you know wish no, nothing but uh, success going forward, man. Awesome spending time with you. Yeah, man, same here. Uh, let me know if Angel, I can if help with anything else. To to of course. We're going to be hitting you up right after this. Let's if someone it, wants to reach out to you, what's the best email to, to reach out on? Uh, reach out to me at angel at, uh, reach out to me on angel at garciateam.com. Angel at garciateam.com. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, buddy. All right, guys. Take care.